Good morning. The, uh, the, I hope you all found coffee at the back there. There's some uh, continental, I guess you'd call continental breakfast available, and uh, we're going to uh, get started. Uh, some of our uh, attendees, I think, are in two potential locations, one being the 401, and somebody suggested some of them are going around in circles on the ring, ring road. So <laughs> we, we think eventually, uh, well, we have probably another 30 or 40 people will be coming, but we have a full day. Uh, my name's Glenn Wright. I'm the chair of the uh, Council for Clean and Reliable Energy. It's a group that we started about 10 years ago. Uh, a group of us, uh, actually over a beer, was <laughs> and, uh, uh, lamenting the fact that we didn't think there was enough uh, open public uh, unbiased forums for discussion of policy issues and uh, technical issues and the future of the energy, um, the energy sector. So we've been at it now for 10 years. Uh, you can see some of the literature that we've, uh, we sponsor uh, publishing people's opinion pieces. Uh, we don't lobby, we don't offer uh, direct advice to the government, uh, except on one issue. Uh, we lobby about governance. Uh, we spent a great deal of time and effort over a couple of years preparing documents on what good governance would look like. We've distributed them widely to go every government in Canada. And our next effort is going to be a session to try and figure out why they're not using it. That's a bit of a joke, but it's true. So, uh, so we're, uh, we're delighted to be here. This is uh, a partnership uh, with uh, the universities. Um, we also have a partnership with the Ivy School, Western, and a very substantial partnership with uh, Waterloo through the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. And uh, it's been a great, uh, a great um, partnership with, with students, faculty, uh, industry, unions, uh, have all participated and do participate in our dialogue. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that came up a little while ago was that we, it seemed that people were, had many different views on the significance of, of technological change that was coming, the impact it would have on policy, uh, the impact it would have on the future of the delivery systems. Um, some thought if you just uh, stand still for a while, it'll go away. Others uh, thought the sky was falling. What we decided to do, and we're hoping this will be an annual event, is to, in collaboration together with uh, WISE, is to uh, have a forum that brings together policymakers, finance people, the universities, uh, professors, students, technology companies, uh, and operators, uh, and uh, that we can have a, a dialogue around and an inf information around where technology is going, what the impact is likely to be, and how that could impact policy in the future. So uh, I'm going to a couple of technical things. There's going to be some showcase stuff that will be set up during the morning. You'll be available at noon. And afterwards, there's a networking session where the uh, technology tables and the uh, poster board uh, idea groups will be at the back. Uh, there will be some electric cars on display behind me outside. So I don't know how you'll brave the cold, whether you have to recover your jacket to go out. but. There's a tent out here. We'll have a couple of cars in it, and we have five different companies that are going to have their cars here at some point during the day, uh, assuming they're not on the highway somewhere. Um, and uh, so safety issues, you can see exits are very prominent here. Uh, the washroom facilities are at the back corridor. You would go off to the back exit sign there. There's a sign that will direct you to the, uh, the facilities. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, let one of us know. At this point, I'd like to call in Jatin, uh, the Executive Director of WISE, to uh, welcome you to the university. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, good morning. Uh, this, my name is Jatin Nathwani. I'm here at the University of Waterloo, uh, the Executive Director of the Institute. And it's my uh, uh, pleasure to welcome you on this rather uh, cool day, but a warm welcome to you for having made the effort to uh, struggle on the highway to get here on time. Uh, so on behalf of the president of the university and, and the senior administration, uh, I hope you make a good day out of this. We have a pretty full 
uh, agenda. Uh, and uh, the subject of the conference, I think, is, is, is quite important. I we steer towards calling it, is there a revolution in the making? Now, that's not a good word in some ways because the last time such things happened, a king lost his head and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, I think this is an important subject, the confluence around technology, technology developments, the innovations that are, that are either around the corner or underneath your feet, and what impact does that have on, on, in essence, the fundamental business models of the industry and how we've been structured. More on that later, uh, but we have an excellent roster of speakers and panelists, so uh, I will uh, now ask uh, Paul Murphy to introduce our uh, uh, keynote speaker. Paul, Paul Murphy was the former head of the IESO. Paul? Good morning, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our, our keynote speaker this morning, Bruce Campbell, the president and CEO of the IESO. His uh, bio is in your, in your brochure. You can read it. Um, um, I'm not going to go over that, but I, I would like to reflect a little bit because Bruce and I go back a long way. Uh, I first met Bruce when he was still with his law firm and providing advice to um, Ontario Hydro and other companies in the energy sector on on energy issues and regulatory matters, and I credit Bruce for being the one to instill an awe of lawyers in me, because Bruce demonstrated that he could, he could argue completely opposite sides of a single issue and be absolutely right both times. <laughs> Bruce, uh, in his time at the IASO, has been involved in all aspects of its development, really right from the outset, the development of the organization, the uh, introduction of a competitive electricity market, and the evolution of that market and operations to ad adapt to the integration of renewable energy. Bruce has uh, proven throughout his career to have incredible integrity. He, uh, he understands the big picture. He knows how things fit together. In fact, he's probably as able as anyone in the province, I would say, to understand how all of the various pieces fit, fit together. He has been a, an effective leader, um, not only within his organization, but within the sector, and at a time when the sector actually needed very good leadership. And he's respected uh, by his peers and colleagues, uh, not just in Ontario, but uh, in the United States as well. One of the other things that Bruce has developed a, a very deep appreciation for over the years is good Italian wine. And best, <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd like that, Paul. And best of all, Bruce has a hairstyle that I can identify with. So please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Bruce Campbell. Can I just, no, I'm okay. okay. So I'm one of the few people here who still works with paper. Some would say that I work with paper and quill pens. Um, but, uh, but, but there it is. I want to thank Paul for that introduction. I'm always nervous when Paul introduces me because when he says things like that, which way overdo uh, my capabilities, it's a real contrast to the days when I reported to him. And it, I don't remember my performance reviews exactly being those words. <laughs> I think there was, there was more uh, achieving what he wanted me to achieve. That's what he described this morning was what he wanted me to achieve. I'm not so sure about that, I, that I've, actually, I've actually done all of that. In any event, I do want to start by thanking the council and WISE for inviting me today. I think the forum is very aptly named as the relationship between technology, innovation, and public policy, and the implications of that for the sector are really increasingly important both in Ontario and in Canada. I want to talk a little bit, not so much about the current policies, but what we see they, they, them implying. Talk a little bit about the past 10 years plus what we see coming with the Climate Change Action Plan. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the innovation part of this, not of technologies, but what we're trying to do with the market. Um, when I come back to this university, I was a Renison College graduate. Um, many years ago, and I did have a little more hair then. 
Um, when I come back to the university, of course, there's a real focus often on the hard bits of technology and the software and everything else. What we are trying to do going forward is take our current market and really rebuild that foundation for energy transactions in the province. Uh, we want a market that responds to and is a good platform for all of the technology developments that we've seen. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about our market project, and I'll just talk then about a couple of, uh, a couple of technological items that we're involved in. Um, I'll embarrass my friend Mark from PowerStream because they've got one of the neat, neatest projects that, uh, that we're working that we're partnering on. So, as you've witnessed, Ontario's electricity sector has gone through some very significant changes in the past decade with the elimination of coal from our system and the increasing amounts of renewables in our supply mix. Through the investment of over 35 billion in new and refurbished assets, We've addressed our reliability concerns of a decade ago and implemented a cleaner supply that is well able to meet Ontario's needs. That change in supply mix brought with it a number of challenges, particularly in managing the variable nature of, of those resources, of our renewable resources. We've worked hard to address those operational issues and I think it's fair to say over the 10-year period we've, we've built and set a North American standards for renewables integration. Um, I can remember going down and speaking in the States from time to time as we were sh shutting down coal in the province, and it was always interesting because you, the, you'd get take questions at the end and we would have laid out, yes, we're doing the coal shutdown, and the first question would always be, and how much coal is going to remain on the system? It was never. It was. It was really interesting that the comprehension of, you know, as we were going through this, the comprehension that you would actually get rid of it all, which seems to be much more commonplace thought now, but it was certainly not not at the time. So, yes, the past decade's been remembered. It will be remembered as one of significant change, but I expect the changes that we'll see over the next ten years will eclipse even what we've dealt with so far. We're seeing a transition to more distributed energy resources, much of which will be renewable. Overall, by 2025, renewable resources are expected to take up nearly 50% of Ontario's installed generating capacity. And it's being incorporated into a system that is much more characterized by two-way flows. And those two-way flows are not just of energy, they're two-way flows of information as well. And that's really what's going to be the secret to unlocking the value of all of these investments. There's also an emphasis on local solutions. Customers are continuing to find ways to help address their own electricity needs, energy efficiency, demand response, uh, load, man load displacement are proving to be cost-effective resources that are being, a being leveraged in a variety of ways to benefit individuals, industries, and the province as a whole. Data-driven solutions are already delivering new insights into consumption patterns and supporting better decision-making about how and when to use electricity. Much of the change we're seeing will be focused on our distribution systems. And I notice the next panel is going to continue to explore, explore that theme. With distributed energy resources being promoted in the context of ongoing regional planning activities across the province. A key goal of our regional planning work is to integrate energy planning seamlessly into local planning, giving communities a greater say in defining and executing their own energy solutions. And Colin Anderson and I did a report that is, was sort of part of the, the early work on this, and we're working hard to implement it. But it is really has always been an amazement to me as you went out across the province Land use planning, very developed processes, very developed practice, and the subdivision would get built and somebody would say, now, okay, could, could you just plug us in over here? It was never thought of. It's just been assumed to be there. And when Colin and I did this work, it was really quite amazing 
uh, how unprepared municipal planners were to deal with that. And I know it's part of his ongoing work and it's certainly part of our ongoing work at the IASO. Engagement is a vital component for that process and it involves transmitters, local distribution companies and the ISO working collaboratively, collaboratively with municipalities, First Nations and Métis, associations and stakeholders to share priorities and preferences for the growth of their communities. So that's one layer of the planning activities underway and policy activities underway, but perhaps not so visible as the provincial planning. But I do believe that the regional and local planning will become increasingly important over time. I think it is the way of the future, particularly given the technologies that are being developed. And of course, there's also broader government policy that has and will continue to drive change. The government's green energy policy largely drove change over the last decade. And now the Climate Change Action Plan, which is aimed at further cutting the province's carbon emissions. The planning outlook that we recently published uh, looks in particular at the impacts of implementing the government's climate change policies. In preparing the planning outlook, we, looked, we considered a range of demand, electricity demand over the next 20 years, from as high as almost 200 terawatt hours to as low as 133 terawatt hours. To give you a sense of where we are now, I think, I think last year we consumed about 143 terawatt hours in the province. Now that broad range covers four different outlooks in our, in our planning document. One that where demand actually declines for over the next 20 years. One that reflects the level of demand that we have today and two outlooks that explore the le higher levels of demand associated with policy choices around climate change and in particular electrification. Yes, there would be choices or challenges associated with meeting those demands. Ontario would require significantly more electricity resources than we have today to meet an aggressive electrification future, but more and more that seems to be the road that people are assuming will be adopted going forward. There are regional requirements that will need to be addressed, but in the, at least in the short term, the need for new resources is not urgent. It will become uh, more prominent as we look into the middle mid-20s. We have a positive supply outlook now, as I said, though, and that's given us an opportunity to look at how new resources are procured. And that's going to take me to my topic of market renewal in the province. I think when we look at all these technologies, as I say, what we're looking for is a platform that serves well to integrate them and to support transactions across the whole sector. And our mutual challenge is to take advantage of the opportunity we have now reasonably strong supply situation, but before we get into the urgency of adding resources, take advantage of the opportunity we have now to evolve Ontario's electricity market to address known market inefficiencies and lay the foundation for a more dynamic marketplace. With increasing variable supply and demand from an expanding number of resources or variety of resources and a growing number of players in the sector, a more efficient market design with transparent price signals will become increasingly important to coordinate the activities of all participants and drive the most cost-effective outcomes. And it's important to recognize that from the system operator's point of view, this isn't just about arriving at an end price for the consumer. Those market operations are essentially woven into producing a reliable performance of the system and coordinating in an efficient way, all of the different resources that we have. So as, as the range of resources op open up as they have and continue to, to do, uh, that coordination function is going to become increasingly important and we need to move our market design to one that will accommodate that well. This market renewal will be a major undertaking both for our organization and for the sector. It represents the most significant enhancement of our electricity design, market design 
since the market opened well over a decade ago. And we believe strongly that this initiative will result in a more efficient market for Ontarians and will provide real public value. Our goal is to redesign our current market, but more importantly, to prepare it to better serve a very different future. Today, small distributed power plants, including renewables like wind and solar, are playing a significant role in our supply mix. The demand side is taking on an increasing role in providing capacity and responding to price signals. And consumers are looking for greater choice and improved opportunities to manage costs. So in the years to come, new and emerging resources will continue to drive change. Electric vehicles, distributed storage resources, smart appliances, energy management systems, all of these and more have the potential to fundamentally change the way the electricity sector operates. Amidst all of that change, we believe energy markets have an essential role to play. Ontario's electricity future will be more complex, more dynamic, and far less certain than what we've experienced to date. Technology will open up new opportunities and will empower customers and suppliers to interact in innovative ways. Properly designed energy markets are, we are convinced, the most efficient tool to organize such a radically different world. Effective markets provide clear signals for the value of needed services and they allow all resources, whether new or existing, to compete to meet those needs. Effective markets also enable individual resources to make informed decisions, minimizing unnecessary costs and risks. For us, market rule is about enhancing the foundations of Ontario's wholesale electricity markets to provide greater transparency, promote competition, and deliver more efficient outcomes. The project has broad reach, addressing the way we schedule energy, procure capacity, and meet operability needs in the province. Most importantly, it will position us to more efficiently meet demand both today and in the future. So what we're thinking is that market design really has to evolve to take advantage of past experiences and respond to the needs of a, of a changing industry. Since the market opened in 2002, the sectors worked together to improve on our initial design, and we have implemented significant changes, like the introduction of, a, of an enhanced day-ahead commitment process. Through the work of the Electricity Market Forum, which was an exercise that we did with our stakeholders about two, three years ago, through the, uh, our constant oversight from the market surveillance panel, past ISO studies, and stakeholder input, we've identified important opportunities to enhance the efficiency of our markets. And because of the, and the timing, we think, is really giving us a unique opportunity to act on past findings and prepare for future opportunities. Working with our stakeholders, we're considering a set of market design changes to be implemented over the coming years, that'll, and we're defining timelines for completing that work. For example, we intend to improve the way we schedule energy in Ontario. We have an inefficient two-schedule pricing system that requires too much out-of-market adjustments. We're going to implement a financially binding day-ahead market improve the way we commit producers in real time, and introduce more schedule, frequent scheduling on Ontario's interties. Use it as an example. Our intertie transactions are now scheduled on an hourly basis, and you tend to get a very big adjustment over the course of the hour. If we can do it on the quarter hour, or even get as close to, get to the position where we could do it on our, the same five minute basis that we dispatch in Ontario, we would have far more efficient outcomes. And that goal of being able to take advantage of regional resources for reliability and efficiency purposes is one that we have in mind as well. As a sector, yes, we've been discussing some of these changes, but as I say, I th we think the timing's right now, and we expect that these changes will deliver substantial improvement over I in the efficiency of our market. Uh, for those of you who follow some of these things in the market, we, we, by replacing the complex two-schedule pricing system, 
we can eliminate uh, inefficiencies associated with out-of-market payments, and we can open the door for other market improvements, like a day ahead in market and, and optimized uh, unit commitments. Paul will remember that we worked together hard under our current design to try and put a binding day ahead market in place. And the point of that is to give you greater certainty as you go into operations in the real-time day. We worked hard to try and do that, but under our current market design, it essentially is become so complex that it was not really worth pursuing. Now, in addition to the energy market, we'll also evolve the way we procure capacity in the province. The ISO is already working with stakeholders to increase participation in our, our demand response auction. We're also facilitating opportunities to export capacity from Ontario to other jurisdictions. So for the first time, we are able to take advantage of some of our surplus capacity and in effect export that capacity when it's not needed in Ontario. Ultimately, we expect to introduce an incremental capacity auction in Ontario to work alongside our contracted and regulated resources. And of course, as time goes on, okay, as time goes on, um, we expect that to use that capacity uh, market to uh, address uh, the need for additional resources. It will happen. Pickering nu Nuclear Station will retire. Existing supply contracts are reaching the end of their life. And of course, we have nuclear units coming offline over the next decade uh, for refurbishment. We believe a capacity auction will provide a stable and transparent mechanism for meeting capacity needs as they arrive, as they ar arise. And under a capacity auction, new and existing resources, technologies, and business models will compete on an equal footing to provide capacity. The mechanism encourages innovation and can accommodate future change. And it's interesting to note today that in Alberta, they've just announced that they remove their market from an energy-only market to uh, add a capacity market as they go through the process of dealing with the shutdown of their coal. And it, it's, I think the, the, they, they, have, they, they have been quite proud of the fact that they ran a pure energy only market. So it's interesting to note that as their policies are changing out there, they're having to bring in other mechanisms to deal with that, the capacity side of the equation. It's quite a different world for them. Now, we're undertaking a lot of analysis around this. I speak of this as if it's a foregone conclusion that we'll do this work. It's not. The first thing that we're doing is uh, undertaking uh, a cost-benefit analysis because we want to be absolutely sure, working with our stakeholders, that putting the effort and money into this is, in fact, going to deliver uh, benefits that will significantly exceed the cost of that we all invest in getting there. We've engaged the Brattle Group as key advisors in doing this work, and our expectation is that the benefits case work will be completed early next year. And if that ex examination demonstrates that there are significant benefits for Ontario electricity ratepayers, then we will proceed working with our stakeholders to implement a comprehensive work plan for market renewal. Along the way, we are, uh, pro we will be providing numerous opportunities for stakeholders to comment on the approach being taken and the findings being made. Our goal is to develop a robust and comprehensive benefits case. And we know that if we're to proceed, we must clearly and convincingly outline the benefits of the proposed changes. And frankly, from my point of view, the best way to ensure that is to make sure all, everybody who's interested has the opportunity to comment along the way as we develop those evaluations. Assuming positive benefits case, our plan is to target three work streams. I've talked a bit about the energy and capacity. We'll also be uh, working on an operability stream as well. 
And as I mentioned earlier, the transition to a single settlement system would eliminate at least some of our current um, out-of-market payments and enable additional market improvements such as, as I had mentioned, a binding day-ahead market and, our, and improve our real-time unit commitment process. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll also, uh, of course, uh, be looking at uh, flexibility on this system and adding that's something that we need more of and growing amounts of and uh, the capacity auction stream will certainly help to address that. We've also, uh, in addition to our, one of our regular stakeholder engagements, which you can follow on our website, uh, we also have a, um, we also have a uh, external working group that will provide an additional level of engagement. The members represent a broad cross-section of market participants who will help guide the market renewal work. And this really is a significant challenge, and I really appreciate the commitment that people are making to, uh, to this process. At the same time, as we do all this market work, there are some current requirements that we need to address. One example is uh, with the changes in the Ontario electricity sector, we have seen an emerging need to introduce the amount of regulation service uh, to support the reliable operation of the system. Regulation service maintains the balance between load and generation really on a second-by-second -second basis. And with our current and expected resource mix, we're looking to increase the amount of regulation service that we currently schedule by 50 to 100 megawatts between 2017 and 19, and ensuring that we have sufficient market depth to schedule another 50 to 100 megawatts on an as-needed basis by 2020. I mentioned this one particularly when I am talking to people who are deeply into the technology development side, and I know that crowd is well represented here. Uh, we have put out a, a, a request for interest uh, earlier, this, earlier this fall. I think it's, it's now been complete, and there will be an RFP going out for this. I'd like to draw everybody's attention to it because I think these new technologies that are being developed are wonderful candidates for providing this kind of service. And uh, just at a personal level, I've just been a little bit disappointed that we haven't seen so much of the developing technologies looking at this as a potential opportunity. So I'm putting my plug in for please watch this space. It may provide you with opportunities that, uh, that uh, uh, allow us to, uh, to support the development of some of those, some of those technologies. So it's our belief that some of these technologies, that, that the regulation service function, that opportunity, does, uh, does offer the opportunity to unlock the value of emerging technologies and fast-moving resources. And as I say, our goal is to increase competition and diversity in our regulation market. Another way we're working to support reliability is by exploring coordination of operations with local distribution companies. Increasingly, local, the local distribution entity is being seen as the logical facilitator of local markets for distributed energy resources. Once you get to a critical mass of these resources, there is a need for some sort of organizing mechanism at the distribution level to signal the value of aggregated distribution resources. And I think you, you can look, for example, to New York with its renewed energy vision, talking about a distribution, oper distribution market platform that would be run, there would be a local market at the distribution level. It's pretty interesting developments. I particularly like to uh, uh, mention the experiment that's going on in New York now in uh, Park Slope, I think it's called, which is using blockchain technology, six or eight connected people connected up, one to one, some, some with, with, uh, with uh, solar, I think it is. But in any event, they're doing transactions, transact 
transactive energy local level using blockchain technology. That's the kind of thing, I mean, if the banks are nervous about blockchain technology, we sure as hell should be too. And, uh, and that's, gonna, that's a whole new level beyond anything that we're dealing with in market design right now. But it's a good illustration of how these technologies will creep into our business. But there are technologies that are providing some key lessons on how we might manage the system of tomorrow. One of those is my, one, and one of my favorites, is PowerStream's Powerhouse project. And Mark, are you going to be speaking to this later? So he'll take you through the details of all of this. This thing is fantastic. It puts its battery storage, rooftop solar, 20 houses, software connected, controlled by the utility, a good chunk of the battery uh, storage capacity is dedicated and controlled by the LDC, and they can add or draw on that or store into it uh, through a kind of centralized dispatch process. Sounds a lot like a little mini ISO right there. Really neat thing about this is their case, I think if they, get, if they put in 30,000 of these, they're a big utility, if it becomes cost effective and they can put in 30,000 of these, from, a, from an ISO point of view, that's equivalent to a 140 megawatt generating unit. All done out of people's houses. I think it's so neat. And we'll be keep, we're working with PowerStream on this uh, through one of our funds. We're actually providing a little bit of money for it. Well, maybe a little more than a little bit of money. Quite a lot of money, actually. <laughs> um, so we're, uh, we're helping to fund that. And uh, I think they're getting very close to being able to report out on this. I think it's going to be fascinating, but it's a real glimpse of where the LDC world is going. As all of these resources get pushed down and embedded into the local distribution companies, it's going to change the world we live in quite a lot. And, that, and it's more than just relying on them for transactions, it's that that whole kind of, I was going to say that wall, perhaps not a good word to use after the US election. That division between the work of the, of the ISO at the system level and the work of the local distribution company, they're going to, we're going to become much more interrelated in our operations, starting with exchange of information and potentially going much farther than that. So I'm going to close. There's a lot going on on the policy side, on the market side, and on the technology sides. The trick from where I stand is how do we bring these together to provide public value? And that's what this conference is all about. And thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. OK. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. The, uh, we really appreciate you uh, being here. It's, uh, you, you have uh, the unique position of being at the uh, point where you've got to keep everything that's currently there going and then have an eye down the road for what's coming, coming at us because it's fine to have ideas and speculate about the future, but you've got to keep the lights on every day. And uh, so that's an interesting perspective and, uh, and you pointed to some of the some really interesting uh, things that are coming up. Uh, we're going to have uh, a brief break. Uh, there's coffee at the back, and uh, we're going to just try and take 10 minutes, and then I'll reconvene you. The comfort, uh, the washrooms are at the back to the right, or my right, towards uh, there, there's signage. And uh, we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you.